All right, let's start and we'll begin in prayer. Face the cross. Is that all passed out? Yeah. Does everybody have a paternoster here? All right. No? If you don't, you can go with your friend. In nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. Fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. Wow, we're going to put the choir out of, uh, out of business. <clears throat> All right, we got a lot to get to. It usually max I can get through eight pages of my notes in one. No, I got yeah, uh, eight pages of my notes in in one hour. Uh, I've got twelve to fourteen, so we won't probably get it all done today. But anyways, um, a couple of ground rules, and that is that we've all probably been in discussions with people complaining about the mass. Well, I was out in California once, and then the priest was wearing, came up in his uh, Santa Claus outfit. That happened to me. Uh, or whatever it may be. And uh, our goal today is, our goal is, or the Easter Bunny, our goal is uh, not to complain about the Mass and the state of the Mass today, but to find out what the liturgy is all about. And um, that's not an easy thing. So we have to put all those little fights and arguments aside, whether you like Father McAfee's Mass or whether you don't like Father McAfee or you do like Pope Benedict the way he says the Mass or you don't or whatever. We'll get rid of all that stuff and place ourselves at the, at the feet of Pope Benedict to learn his perspective on the liturgy. That's our goal. Um, hopefully to come out of here after, during Advent after three um, sessions with a better understanding of what the Mass is all about so that when we go to Mass, we'll be taken up into it more fully. Okay? Um, so, just to start out, we're going to go over some things maybe some of you have gone over with me before, uh, in little parts of it. Um, just some principal things, so feel free to answer the question. We move the thing along as fast as possible. Um, what is the Mass? What is the Mass? Oh, wait, I have two announcements after me. I'll go back to what is the Mass so you can record them properly. Um, Dr. O'Donnell's coming, okay, who's the president of Christendom College. This is his money talk, like the best one. He's, it's his, his go-to talk. So don't miss this and bring your friends because it's just eye-opening what he has to say. Okay? Uh, once a year he gives his talk at Christendom College to, to the students, the uh, freshman students for their history class, and they all come together for that one class because there's no other teacher that can do what he does. So don't miss that. The flyers are back there in the back. Also, if you pray the office, or if you don't pray the office, you can start. Um, Father Gripsover is giving a little series, uh, or a little talk, one talk, on praying the office during Advent because there's some changes that happen and that kind of thing, so you need to stay with it. Uh, and that flyer's in the back. That is December 2nd, which is this coming Saturday, okay? 9.30 a.m. in this room. So those are the two things. And then it's actually the following... Is it the following weekend? Well, whatever. Anyways, there it is. The flyers are in the back. And the final announcement is Spirit of the Liturgy. I got a bunch of copies by the Pope. If you don't have it, it's back there for 12 bucks. normally 18, no, normally $20, $18, 19 $20. Okay? It's, we're, it's wholesale. So get it, give it away as a gift, door prizes, Christmas, you know, the whole bit. Great book. All right, what is the Mass? What is the Mass? What do we mean by the word Mass? Oftentimes we use all these words in theology or in the church and it's kind of like you know, the haze of church talk or God talk. So what does the word the Mass or Mass mean? Where does it come from? What's its root? You can look on the, on the board if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go. It is sent forth. Okay. And so it began to be used, is that last phrase used in the liturgy? So it began to be used in reference to what we do in there on Sunday, or every day in the morning. Okay, the Mass. A more ancient word, before that came in, into practice, that shows up for the first time in St. Ambrose around 397. Okay, before that, what Christians did in that church over there was called the liturgy. Okay, and the liturgy is simply defined as the work of the people in secular terms. It was used in Greek culture to refer to what the citizen did in his responsibilities as a citizen toward the common good. Okay? But it was used even among the Jews 
in reference to what the priests did in the temple. Okay? And it was taken into Christian usage. If you want to put in your notes, if you're writing something, you put Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, where Christ is called, the, in English really, the one who does the liturgy, the liturgy guy, whatever you want to say. Okay? Um, the one who offers the service. Chapter 8, verse 6. What is this public work, or what is this work that is going on in the church? What is taking place that we kind of call it a public work? What work is happening there? Another term used in the early church, probably more ancient in regards to what the Christians do, more ancient than even the use of, of liturgy, is Eucharistia, or Eucharist. Christians come together to celebrate the Eucharist. Okay, and what does the word Eucharist mean? Again, we call it the Eucharist. What does it mean? We have no idea. It's kind of unfortunate. We go around using all these terms that we have no idea, and so we create this whole, you know, this whole language of God that doesn't really mean anything to us. Okay, so what does the word Eucharist mean? Simply thanksgiving. Okay, it is the act of showing forth thanks. So the Mass is the work by which we show forth thanks, or show forth the good. Okay, Sacrosanctum Concilium in Vatican II. Okay, one of the, the liturgy document in Vatican II says, It is the action of Christ, the priest, and his body, which is the church. It is the sacred action surpassing all others. No action of the church can equal its efficacy. Okay, it is the highest action that the church does. And who does it? Is it just the church? Who offers the Eucharist? The priest. What is this? Is it warm in here or not? A little bit, yeah. I'll read it to you again. It is the action of Christ the priest and his body, which is the church. It is the sacred action surpassing all others. Who offers the Eucharist? Yeah. It is the work of Christ par excellence. It is His highest work. What happens in that building on Sunday morning is the work of Christ. And it is the one work which He came to accomplish. Pope Benedict, quoting the Second Vatican Council, says, says, The Second Vatican Council defined the liturgy as the work of Christ the priest and His body, which is the church. The work of Jesus Christ is referred to in the same text as the work of redemption, which Christ accomplished, especially by the paschal mystery of His passion, of His resurrection from the dead, and His glorious ascension. By this mystery, in dying He destroyed our death, and in rising He has restored our life. What work of Christ is accomplished for our salvation in that church on Sunday morning? What work of Christ? What does he do? Feel free, go. What's that? Yeah, he dies for us. It's not just dies for us. He resurrects from the dead and he ascends into heaven. Why is it that it is that work of Jesus Christ that justifies, that redeems, that saves mankind? What is it that is required in justification, in justice, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, die for us upon the cross? Atonement. Flesh that out. What do you mean? What's that? <laughs> All right, atonement. Why not? Keep going. Explain that.
injustice that's been that has been committed is that grave. So who so is saying Okay. Let me put that in sentence form because I wrote that exact same sentence down here for you. Okay, because, because our offense against, is against an infinite God, only God can do an act which infinitely cancels out our infinite offense. Okay, Does that make sense? Because our sin is against an infinite subject, God... Okay, so therefore, he is infinitely offended. Therefore, only the infinite one, Jesus Christ, can offer something which cancels out that infinite offense. Does that make sense? Kind of? A little bit. Okay. I wrote that down because that's the most common explanation in theology, at least Theology 101, getting going. That's, the, that's a common thing. You're going to read a lot. You're going to see a lot. And you're going to hear a lot. Okay, So Jesus Christ was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary in order to cancel out the infinite offense which Adam had committed against God and that we are all inheritors of. We're going to come back to that. Okay, Let's hold on to that. In order to understand, to get at this this question of what the liturgy is really all about and why is it that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection... Notice we've only in that definition given an account of the death. Jesus Christ died and therefore the Father's happy. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll put the question to you. Which father among the fathers here, having a son which offended him, terribly offended him, would stand in justice until that son paid back every single penny, every single bit which he offended you for. Which one of his fathers? I'm a father. No. But in perfect justice, we say, God demands of his son that he be nailed to a cross and die in order that man be forgiven. Okay. I'll put it out to you. That's not a God I believe in. That's not the Father I believe in. The one who loves me infinitely. The one who desires my life, not my death. Okay. We're going to come back to this over the next three talks and deal with it. But it's a problem in, in theology that we give. It's, a, it's an easy answer to give in some sense. And I think, and, it, and the Pope thinks, it's very much inadequate and possibly even very much wrong. Okay? Wait, can you yeah. Yeah, that God in perfect justice demands death of, of his son okay. in order that man be saved. Okay? Yeah. Go ahead. What's that? Okay, that's going to get part way. Okay, that's going to get us somewhere. Some, what, what is it about this action of Jesus Christ which He willingly does for us that saves mankind? First of all, why does man need to be saved? Always come back to this question. Why are we even doing this in the first place? Because of original sin. It's necessary to go back, and you guys are going to get tired of me doing this with you, constantly to go back and deal with the problem in the first place. To go back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 and deal with the situation as it is. To find out who man is. To find out what man has done and where a man now stands that he is in need of Jesus Christ being his Savior. Okay? Okay? It's necessary to go back there. And the question really revolves around who man is. Who is man that the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ saves him, restores him to what was lost in the fall? 
Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, that's, I, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, no, yes, in some sense. However, I would say that God planned to share his life with man in the beginning. We're going to talk about that a lot. And there's not a whole lot greater than sharing the life of God. He had planned for Adam in the beginning to live in paradise, in, delight, in the delight of God. No, it cannot. Because Adam was created in the beginning in the image and likeness of God. Right? Not just on a natural level, but on a supernatural level. That God gifted him with sonship. And that's where the fall comes in. You can even see that he's yeah. walking with God in the garden. But even there, you can see that there's That's right. Well, yes, some fathers have said, look, what Adam was going to have in the beginning, it seems as though Jesus Christ comes and, and brings us even higher than what we would have had. Okay, and that's, I mean, it's not, the church hasn't theologically set it down. Oh, happy fault. Yes, that's true. Okay, but what we don't want to do is forget that God in the beginning had planned something wonderful for his son, for his children. Okay, that he would live in covenant union with them. What that looked like, we don't really know. What we do know is what Jesus Christ has come to give us. But what we don't know still is what he has planned for us. Okay? It's possible, isn't it, that uh, I mean, he could have pricked his finger and, and, and saved us from, from salvation. And it, but he went through the horrible pits of the passion to show us how horrible sin is. Yeah, theologians have said that simply being born of the Blessed Virgin Mary redeems man, and it's true. We can talk about that um, later on. Okay, let's keep going. Who is man before the fall? What is his identity? A son of God. What does the text say? What does Genesis chapter 1 say? Verse 26, I believe. He is made in the image and likeness of God. Sorry, my handwriting is so bad. I don't even have to spell it out. Those that were in the Genesis series with me. Image and likeness of God. It refers to sonship, yes. What else does it refer to? Who is God that man has made in his image and likeness? It doesn't say that in Genesis chapter... Well, it does mention the Spirit. You're right. But what does it say in Genesis chapter 1? Who is God? A creator. Okay? God is a creator. And man is made in the image and likeness of God. Who is man? A creator. Okay? Something is revealed about God as creator in chapter 1 that's going to take us a little bit further than just a creator. Okay? Islam teaches that God is the creator of the world, and yet he is totally disconnected from his creation. Okay? He's separated from it. He's not a personal God, okay, involved with his creation. But for Israel and for us, God is something very much different than that. And something is revealed in Genesis chapter 1 of how he sees creation. How does he see creation? Yeah. Yeah, over and over again, like he's beating us over the head with a hammer, right? Over and over again, saying, I see it as good. It is good. It is good. Don't you ever forget it. It is good. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, what does it mean for something to be good? It's complete or finished or perfect. Okay? It's what it's supposed to be. What else if I see something as good? What if I see the water? And in fact, I do. I'm thirsty. (laughs) 
I see this bottle of water as good. What do I mean by that? Yeah. I desire it. I need it in some way. Okay? There's two aspects, well, there are a number of way, ways we use good, but two primarily. And one is that I see it as something desirable for me, something that fulfills me. But sometimes we see something as good, I'll say ontologically, in its existence, in its being. And in that way, we see it as in reference to its end. Okay? If I say I desire the good of the thing, I desire the good of my child, what do I mean by that? My baby. What do I mean? That's right. I desire its perfection, right? I desire it to come to be in the way it's supposed to be. Okay? Joseph Pieper, who I know we're supposed to be studying Cardinal Ratzinger. I'm going to quote a number of different people, okay? only because they have reference to what the Pope's talking about. I'll quote the Pope plenty of times. Okay? But Joseph Pieper is helpful for us in this regard. He says in his work on love, Love is the affirmation of the existence of the other. It is to say to the other, It is good that you are. How wonderful that you exist. The most extreme form of affirmation that can possibly be conceived is creatio. Making to be in the strict sense of the word. Creation is the comparative of affirmation. So what's he saying? That when God says it is good, he sees his creation as lovable, as desirable, as wanting its perfection. And man is made in the image of of that God. Therefore, man is made to do what? To To know, love, and serve God. In this text, man is made to do what? To be a creator. Okay, I know that sounds a little bit a little bit crazy. (laughs) What do you mean he's made to be a creator? Only God creates. When you see something is good and desire its perfection, you help bring it into being. You help make it perfect. Okay? Look at the commandments that God gives to Adam and Eve in the beginning. What does He say to them? What does He say for them to do? Yeah, to be fruitful and multiply. And what? Anson? To till and keep the garden. I'm just going to go to Anson if I have any. We have to get through a talk something. Anson's been with me enough times. I don't know why he still comes. But to be fruitful, multiply, and to till and keep. What is a commandment? We, oftentimes we think of commandments that God gives us, the Ten Commandments, as God saying, uh, don't do that, don't do that, do this, do this, don't do that. Binding man in. The church gives us commandments. You have to go to church on Sunday, otherwise it's a mortal sin and you'll go to hell for it. Oh, that's mean church. Mean God gives us Ten Commandments. What is a commandment? What's that? It's a rule. It's an instruction on how to act. When you buy a car... What's in the glove compartment when you open it? The manual. manual. And if you follow the instruction, the manual, your car is going to last a while, won't it? Hopefully. Okay? And if you don't follow that instruction and you pour, you know, whatever, uh, Kool-Aid into your gas tank, what's going to happen? It's going to break. It's not going to work the right way. It's definitely not going to be perfect. The commandments God gives us are His teachings, His ways, because He is the one that has made us and knows what our good is, what our perfection is. He tells us what to do in order to achieve it. Okay? To till and keep, to be fruitful and multiply. 
There's a philosophical principle that I've spoke with some of you about. We're going to go over and over again all the time. I'll constantly go back to it. And that is that act follows being. What does that mean? Act follows being. Annie? Mm-hmm. Okay, you're off. Who else? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, you can always know a thing based upon how it acts because its action follows upon what it is. Okay? I don't run around barking like a dog. Dogs do that. When a thing runs around barking like a dog, you know it's a dog. It looks like a dog. It runs like a dog. It barks like a dog. It's a dog. Okay? Action follows upon being. Look at what the thing does and you'll know what it is. God tells us what to do in order that we know who we are. Be fruitful and multiply. What happens when, you're, when you are fruitful and you multiply? Yeah, things come into being. Okay? What happens when you till and keep a garden? Yeah, the thing becomes fruitful. Okay? You bring about its creation, or you further its creation, you further its perfection. Man is made in the image and likeness of a loving creator. Man is supposed to be a loving creator, bringing about the perfection of the world through his interaction with it. Wait, say it loud so everybody can hear you. What's that? We create sins. Well, that's right. I mean, we, we end up, because of our, our capacity, our involvement in creation, we end up being able to either order it rightly or order it wrongly. Okay? That's why when Adam fell, all of creation inherited that fall. Not just man. All of creation was disfigured. What's that? It's goodness. It doesn't, it doesn't change its perfection, its end of what it's supposed to be, but it does change in, in the sense that it doesn't quite reflect the Creator that it was supposed to. It doesn't do what it's supposed to. Okay? Absolutely. That's why. That's right. That's why animals, you know, are, are dead on the side of the road. Okay? God never planned for death to be strewn all over the place in front of us. That was not His plan in the beginning. We brought death into the world, and there it is. We see it before us. Okay? Now, yeah. Look at one more thing about God and His relationship with man. You notice that after man is created... God walks in the garden. Who was mentioning that? Yeah. And God walks in the garden, and what does He do? What does He say? He's looking for who he created. Now, before that, though, before that, He says, Behold, this is what you are to eat. Behold, these are the plants over here that the animals are supposed to eat. Okay? You know, man was a, actually a vegetarian in the beginning, in creation. Okay? God is involved in His creation, showing man how to relate to it. Okay? Father um, Francis Martin, who is a a follower of the philosophy of Pope John Paul II, says, God is not an absentee landlord, but the ever-present Creator who directs human beings and explains to them how to be kings who who reveal God. Okay? Have dominion like this. Relate to creation like this. Namely, as a loving creator. Ordering creation towards its proper end. Don't misuse this, Adam. Okay? This is made to do this. In other words, this tree is to be eaten by you. This tree is not to be eaten by you. 
this animal is to eat this over here, and so forth. And Adam is to reflect God in that, to go about relating with creation in such a way that it brings about its perfection. Are we getting cold in here again now? Have we gone to hot to cold? All right. No, that's all right. What is the culmination of creation? What is the high point of creation? Yes, man. Why is man created last then? Why is man created? No, the angels were created before man. She said, why aren't they greater? Is what she said. Oh, well, that gets to a good question. We'll, we can get to that probably in the third week. Okay. Why was he created last if he's the high point of creation? That's right. Okay, here's what the Catechism says. God created everything for man. What is it that is about to be created that enjoys such honor? It is man, that great and wonderful living creature, more precious in the eyes of God than all other creatures. For him, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all the rest of creation exist. God attached so much importance to his salvation that he did not spare his own son for the sake of man. Nor does he ever cease to work, trying every possible means until he has raised man up to himself and made him sit at the right hand of the Father. Okay, quoting St. John Chrysostom there. Man is the culmination or the high point of creation. But he's not the end. It doesn't end with man. Okay, what follows upon the creation of man? That's right, the creation of woman, yes. I, when, I speak, <laughs> when I speak of man, I mean man and woman. That's right. From God came forth creation and culminated in the creation of man. But there's a further perfection for creation. And that is the seventh day. What happens on the seventh day? God rests. God rests. Okay. What else happens on the seventh day? What happens when God rests? He blesses and sanctifies. God doesn't sit back with a cold core's light. Okay? He blesses and sanctifies. Again, Father Martin says, No one hearing this text in ancient Israel would think only of a rest for God on this day, but would immediately recognize that God's people were called to image God in a way open to all human beings, but actualized only by Israel. They are called to imitate God not only in His activity, but in His perfecting of creation by resting on the day made holy by God Himself. Okay, The image and likeness of man or the image and likeness of God, doesn't end with the creation of man. But man is called into the seventh day as image and likeness. And God on that seventh day rests. And when God rests, He blesses and He sanctifies. What happens when something is blessed? It is set apart. What What do we mean by that? Okay. It's made holy. When something is blessed, it is made holy. Okay, this is what St. Thomas Aquinas says. The sanctification of each creature consists in its resting in God. For this thing, for this reason, things dedicated to God are said to be sanctified. Okay? Things dedicated to God are said to be sanctified, made holy. What is man called to do on the seventh day? To rest. And when he rests in God, what is he called to do? (laughs) Sit back and have a Coors Light? (laughs) To bless creation. Isn't that what God does? To bless or to be blessed? Ah, which one? Which one? 
Both. To be blessed by God and then turn as His image and likeness and be His hand of blessing to creation. And when creation is blessed, what happens to it? It is dedicated to God. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas says. And when it is dedicated to God, it is made holy. That is what man is designed to do in the beginning. That is what God wants him to do. When a thing is blessed and it is made holy, it is made perfect. It is brought to its fulfillment. It is made truly good. Okay? God didn't make all of creation in a static situation and just say, there it is, it's done. He made it in some way like children, all of creation. And then he said, Adam, you go and you make it become what it's supposed to become. Namely, to rest in me and to be made holy. Okay? Notice that man is not the only one that is made in the image and likeness of God. Well, you could say he's the only one made in the image and likeness of God. But he's not the only thing that is supposed to become the image and likeness of God. Man is to dedicate all of creation so that it shines forth the glory of God that it participates in its own way in the life of God. That's where the priesthood of Adam comes in. That Adam is to take all of creation and dedicate it to the Creator to make it holy. Okay? Sedona the Syrian, one of the church fathers, says, Like a living sacrifice suitable and pleasing to God, He employs his body for rational service. He consecrates and somehow presents to God the vows and the offerings of all his limbs and offers the sacrifices suitable for the action of grace, which are the rational fruits of the the lips of those who confess his name by incessantly celebrating God in their body and soul, God to whom they belong now and in definitive oblation. That in that act of offering all of creation to God, Adam himself is offered to God. He is to be blessed. He is to recognize who God is and then take all of creation and recognize it as created by the Creator. To recognize it is not His, but God's. Okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay. It's at this point that we can start to see the origin of worship and the origin of liturgy. Okay? Pope Benedict, in his book, Spirit of the Liturgy, which we're going to use primarily as our text over the next three weeks, says, Thus we can see what the foundation of existence is. It is the steadfast adherence to the law of God which orders human affairs rightly. That is, by organizing them as realities that come from God, you can see it here, that come from God, and are meant to return to God. Sedona, the, the, the church father I was quoting just a second ago, makes reference to oblation, to sacrifice, to offering. What is this sacrifice that Adam is supposed to make? What is sacrifice? What is sacrifice? Okay. Any other thoughts? Something that has to be killed. Any other thoughts? What's that? What in what sense? Okay. How is it given? How is it offered? It has to be destroyed. Most of the time, we have our Old Testament images and the image of Jesus Christ being crucified, right? These burnt offerings, these offerings of sacrifice, the lamb, the throat is slit and bled. Okay? Christ is nailed to the cross. And again, we come back to our definition or our answer to why Jesus Christ had to die for us. Because God required His death. 
God required the death of His Son. God required the death of the lambs. And so forth. So far we don't have too much of a pretty image of God. Okay, A God who is bloodthirsty. In Spirit of the Liturgy, if you have the book, you can... Uh, don't turn to it because I'm going to skip around a little bit, but it's on page 27 through 28. He says, he says, what is worship? Okay, and then he says, in all religions, sacrifice is at the heart of worship. Okay, this is important. Because in order to understand what is going on in that church on Sunday, in order to understand what worship is, we have to get to the heart of it. And at the heart of it, the Pope says, is sacrifice. And as we have said, we've all heard, the sacrifice fundamentally is the destruction of the thing in order that it can be removed from man's use and therefore dedicated to God. Is that fair? The Pope says, yes. Well, we'll get to that. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully we'll have an answer for that by the end today. What pleasure is God supposed to take in destruction? Is anything really surrendered to God through destruction? One answer is that destruction always conceals within itself the act of acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things, which was one of our other answers. But can such a mechanical act really serve God's glory? Obviously not. True surrender to God looks very different. It consists in the union of man and creation with God. Belonging to God has nothing to do with destruction or non-being. It is rather a way of being. It is rather a way of being. Get that in your heads. It has nothing to do with non-being. It is rather a way of being. That is why St. Augustine could say that the true sacrifice is the Chivitas Dei. That is, love transformed mankind. The divinization of creation and the surrender of all things to God. God all in all. This is the purpose of the world. That is the essence of sacrifice and worship. And so we can now say that the goal of worship and the goal of creation as a whole are one and the same. Divinization. A world of freedom and love. The whole goal of creation and the goal of what we do in there on Sunday, the Pope says, has nothing to do with destruction. He goes further. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross and its salvific effects upon man has nothing to do with His destruction. But it has everything to do with the perfection of mankind. With life. God does not desire death. God desires that we live. That was His plan from the beginning and it is His plan today. 28, 27-28. Father Joseph Fitzmaier has this to say. The blood shed in sacrifice, speaking about the Old Testament sacrifices, was not then a vicarious punishment meted out. Is it meted or meted? Meted. I was thinking about that before. I was like, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Meted out. There's another word we'll get to like that. Meted out in an animal, in an animal instead of on the person who immolated it, which is our common view of the sacrifice of Christ. Rather, the life of the animal was consecrated to God. It was a symbolic dedication of the life of the person who sacrificed to Yahweh. It is not Pauline teaching that the Father willed the death of His Son to satisfy the debts owed to God or to the devil by human sinners. Okay, That is the, that is the most common thing. St. Paul, in his Theology of Justification makes God stand, stand in the courtroom with His Son and say, in perfect justice, I demand your death because of what Adam did. And what Father Joseph Fitzmaier is saying, who is one of the greatest Pauline scholars of our time, 
And what the Pope is saying is that Paul has nothing, doesn't want to talk about that at all. He has no interest in that. That's not his point whatsoever. That what Paul is talking about is rather the life of God communicated to man in some way through the death of Christ. And we'll get to that. Everything about the sacrifice of Christ has to do with the life of man and not with death. I don't know what I said. When Jesus Christ is crucified, it is not God standing and demanding the death of His Son that He takes pleasure in and somehow then ignores what Adam did. Rather, it is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that man comes to live. And that is what God desires. That God desires the the life of His children and not their death. Going too far? Yeah. I, th- I think the difficult. No, I know. Justice. I am not downplaying justice, but what we don't want to do is take our concept of justice, okay, and then imprint it upon God who transcends all of our categories. Okay? Not only that, we don't want to take a, a ca- the justice which we, don't, our, our, we ourselves don't even adhere to and then imprint it upon God as perfect. Yeah, what is justice? What's your definition of justice? It's, uh, it's to give to each his due. Yeah. Okay, to give to each his due. Then the answer is... You got a bug there, Mon? Good. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're saying that it's truly because, because of sin. It wasn't oh, that there would be some sort of sacrifice uh-huh. okay. for the sake of that sin. So Hold on. justice, Hold on. he does require it. Nah. He doesn't Hold on. Hold on. Justice is giving to the other that which is his due. And what is due to a thing is what helps it become what it's supposed to become. We put, hold on, we put somebody in prison not in order to punish them for what they did, but in order that they can become what they're supposed to be. Yeah. It's a little bit different there. I'm talking about man. That when God yeah, in justice that's why that's why I'm rejecting what you're saying. But we in, with hold on. But God in justice is looking at his son and desiring what is his due. And what is his due? Wait, his what is yeah, what is man's due? Okay. Yeah. That's why I was rejecting. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. What is man's due? That's what we're trying to get after. Yes, but, what, even, but we can sit, still sit there and say, what is due to this thing? And what is due to it is that God desires its life. So you're saying what is due to man, not yes, what is due to God. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. What I don't get is that God, in order to give us life, needed his own life. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Okay. The Pope gives us, he, like, he uses this particular uh, explanation of the exitus by which creation, by which God freely creates His creation. It's the free act of creation. The act of God's love towards creation. It's the overflow of God's love and affirmation towards creation which culminates in the creation of man. Okay. And on the other side, he talks about the ready tos, the return. Okay, exit and return. Okay. The ready tos, which is the free act of creation oriented by man back to the Creator. And thus, it's divinization. It's coming to rest in God. The exitus and ready tos. Pope John Paul II teaches 
God is love. And as I'm reading this, remember, man is made in the image and likeness of God. God is love, and in Himself He lives a mystery of personal loving communion, creating the human race in His own image and continually keeping it in being. God inscribed in in the humanity of man and woman the vocation and the capacity and responsibility of love and communion. Love is therefore the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Okay? That is what man is supposed to do, is to love like God loves. To see creation as good. Or in other words, to see it in relation to its perfection and help bring about that perfection. Okay? And Pope Benedict, mirroring ex- almost exactly what, what John Paul II said. In the reditus, which is the worship of man, the creature existing in its own right comes home to itself. And this act is an answer in freedom to God's love. It accepts creation from God as His offer of love and thus ensues a dialogue of love. That that holy new kind of unity that love alone can create. The being of the other is not absorbed or abolished, but rather in giving itself, it becomes fully itself. Okay? God gives creation to man, and man takes that creation and orients it back to its creator, where it finds its ultimate perfection. You guys okay over there? What happened? Oh, you got the bug. They got the bug. We didn't know what you were laughing at. Okay. <laughs> the sacrifice of man then because becomes an image of the gift of God. Okay? The sacrifice of man is the image of the gift of God. God gives himself In creation, he loves creation, and man turns and responds to God in love and offers that sacrifice, as Sedona said, that sacrifice of love, that sacrifice, that oblation of his rational his his rational gifts. Okay, offering all of creation back to God. Joseph Pieper. It is God who in the act of creation anticipated all conceivable human love and said, I will you to be. It is good, very good that you exist. He has already infused everything that human beings can love and affirm. Goodness, along with existence. And that means lovability and affirmability. Human love, therefore, is by its nature and must inevitably be always an imitation and a kind of repetition of this perfected and in the exact sense of the word creative love of God. But in human love, something more takes place than a mere echo a mere repetition and imitation. What takes place is a continuation and in a certain sense even a perfecting of what was begun in the course of creation. I quoted from the Catechism earlier, section 358, paragraph 358, which said, God created everything for man. And I left out a little phrase. And the Catechism continues. And when you're reading the Catechism, that's, that's the Pope. Okay? He was like the mastermind of the whole thing. So... It's actually, I was reading one of his books, and he was saying, you've got to read the Catechism. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the only one, but I mean, he was definitely one of the, the major hitters in there. God created everything for man, but man in turn was created to serve and love God and to offer all of creation back to him. Okay? Can we have, we started like 8.20, right? Didn't we? Go ahead. Okay, we got five minutes. Okay, because we've got to get, I got five minutes, we'll get through five pages. Okay. It's here that the seventh day comes back into view. Okay. And the seventh day is the day for what, Annie? It's the day for blessing. And when something is blessed, it is made holy, which is an attribute of God Himself. It's made like God in some way. Okay. The seventh day is the day for. Covenant. Seventh day. Right? For the Jews, the seventh day is the day of covenant. 
We don't have to get into the reason why you should come to Genesis Bible study. You missed out. Okay? For the Jews, the seventh day was the day for a covenant union. Okay? You look throughout the Old Testament, whenever there's a marriage, seven days. Okay? Covenant union. Okay? It is the day when the covenant between God and man is supposed to take place. And what happens in a covenant? What happens to the two parties in a covenant? Unified. Right. In marriage, what do we say? The two what? Become one. Okay? And the Pope again, in Spirit of the Liturgy, page 20, 26, 25 and 26, says, Creation moves toward the Sabbath to the day on which man and the whole created order participate in God's rest and His freedom. Creation exists to be a place for the covenant that God wants to make with man. The goal of creation is the covenant, the love story of God and man. He goes on. The covenant is a relationship. God's gift of Himself to man, but also man's response to God. Man's response to the God who is good is to love Him. And loving God means worshiping Him. Loving God means worshiping Him. It's on that seventh day that man is called to recognize God as Creator and to offer all of creation, to bless it, to sanctify it, to make it holy, and offer it to God. It's that relationship of love that we see develop when Moses ascends Sinai. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, what happens to him? You remember when he comes back down? What's different about Moses? What happens to him? Turn to 2 Corinthians for me. 2 Corinthians. What happens to Moses? Yeah, he's changed. Why? Yeah, because he sees God. 2 Corinthians chapter... Um, sorry, I have it right here. Don't you have it highlighted? Chapter 3, verse 16, I think. <laughs> Why is it not here? Yes, thank you. Look, go back a couple, a couple sentences. Look... When we come into contact with God, when creation is blessed and rests in God and beholds God, what happens to creation? Just like Moses ascending Mount Sinai. Okay? The question is, what happens in the liturgy? What happens in worship? That man is justified, that he is made right. That something that he lost at the fall somehow comes back to him. Okay, go ahead, Anson. All right, skip a couple sentences. So when a man turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we are, we are all this unveiled thing, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed in His likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay, so what's being said by St. Paul? By looking upon God, by coming into the presence of God and beholding Him, man is transformed into what? into His image and likeness. Okay? So there's, there's two actions or two sides that we need to look at here. First of all, or you say three, looking at God and recognizing Him as Creator. And in that recognition, taking all of creation and offering it back to God, placing it in the presence of God so that the things which are placed in the presence of God, most importantly you and I, are transformed into His image and likeness. We are divinized through worship. We are divinized through worship. Return. There's one word, I beat you. The Pope. Again, page 18, Spirit of the Liturgy. Liturgy in the proper sense is part of this worship. But so too is life according to the will of God. Such a life is an indispensable part of true worship. 
The glory of God is the living man, but the life of man is the vision of God, says St. Says Irenaeus. Ultimately, it is the very life of man, man himself as living righteously, that is the true worship of God. But life only becomes real life when it receives its form from looking toward God. Okay? In righteousness, in, in perfect order, man is called to worship God. That is his life. Man living righteously is another way of saying man taking all of creation and offering it back to God to recognize Him as the one from who it comes and to whom it is to be returned. All right, let's conclude with that. And um, I'll just have to talk about a couple of things when we come back. And that leaves us with that thought, looking towards God, okay? which is what we're going to come back to next week, facing God, and talk about that in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and today. Okay? Do um, you guys have any questions as we conclude? You're all okay? All right, let me just give you a quick one, 30 second little inspirational thing and say that every Advent I teach a series. This is the series I'm teaching this Advent. And every single Advent, people start out and say, For Advent, I'm going to do this. Okay? <laughs> By the end of Advent, Christmas is on us and we've got to go shopping. Okay? And I just encourage you say, Look, this is something. For Advent, I'm going to do. Because if we don't prepare during Advent for the coming of Christ, Christmas will come and we won't recognize who was born that day. We'll recognize Santa Claus and all those things. We won't recognize Christ. Okay, so I encourage you to come, keep coming and bring your friends also so we can make the group grow. Okay, and you have to eat a bunch of that stuff because otherwise I'm going to lose my job for buying it all. So we'll finish in, let's finish in, uh, in prayer. In nomine patri et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Benedict, pray for us. In nomine patri et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Thank you, guys.